start. So today we'll talk about um, uh, how do we take care of our neuro neurocritical care patients. So um, the title is Neuro ICU Bedside Nursing and General Review. It's really um, my take on what I think would be useful tools for the nurses to know generally how to look after these patients and uh, help them progress through their illness and meet their critical care needs. Um, and this applies to patients with these injuries, whether they're in the MICU, surgical ICU, dedicated neural ICU, depending on the setting of your institution. Um, here currently at our institution, uh, most of our uh, neuro ICU patients are going to be in the medical ICU, except for the neurotrauma patients will be in the surgical ICU. Um, uh, there are plans to move into a dedicated neuro ICU for a lot of cerebrovascular patients in particular. Um, we'll see how things progress with that. In any case, as a critical care nurse, this is an important skill set uh, to have, as you will have often patients with medical in the medical ICU who then develop neurological injury as well. And we'll be taking care of those patients too. Uh, this is a disclosure statement uh, from uh, UMC who's uh, providing um, uh, some of the continuing education credits. I don't have any financial disclosures um, regarding anything in this presentation. So these are the key objectives. We want to talk about um, what's the assessment of the patient uh, that you'll be performing at the bedside, uh, what are the deteriorating factors um, that would prompt you to intervene on this patient and um, start the, the, uh, the first interventions. And we also then want to talk about, after discussing the generalities, a bit more specifically about, for in particular, the cerebrovascular patients and more interventional patients, um, what are the procedures that we perform and what's the specific post-operative care for these patients. Um, uh, lastly, um, uh, what, what a lot of um, uh, people want to know about is what's the proper technique of managing a patient with ventriculostomy. And uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about hyperosmolar therapy uh, for them. So the kind of first part is the general overview. Um, We'll focus on the nursing assessment and triggers, and then we'll talk a bit about specific interventions and conditions, uh, and then that, lastly about the ventriculostomy and osmolar therapy. There is overlap between these topics as we move forward. So, the general principles of the neural ICU is to reduce the effects of the primary neurological injury. Now, the best way to reduce the effects of primary injury is to prevent it altogether. Uh, and that's the realm of public health and the realm of our education to the family members um, uh, and uh, to our patients. Um, for example, if somebody comes in with a stroke and you know, so it's a teaching opportunity for the rest of the family members so they learn about hypertension control and smoking cessation. Um, uh, prevention and reduction of secondary injury is probably what we do the most in the ICU. You don't want things to get worse, you don't want any second injury to occur. At the same time, these are critically ill patients that can have uh, consequences of their injury outside the affected organ. The same way in the, MI, in the CICU, um, patients after myocardial infarction will have systemic effects. In the MICU patients with uh, lung disease, for example, uh, aspiration pneumonia or ARDS will have systemic effects. Uh, patients who are neurologically injured, there will be systemic effects on the other organs. So we need to support the other organs while we're reducing the secondary injury to the brain. So it's always that balance that we um, uh, try to, to walk. Um, and we act in the ICU as part of a continuum of care, right? We usually receive the patients from the, from the ER or for the interventional suite or the uh, operating room. And then these patients are going to be transitioning to their rehabilitation phase, whether it's directly or via uh, the uh, hospital floor. So this is kind of a, a view on the process. There's a primary injury, it's just tissue ischemia, raise it to cranial pressure, mechanical disruption of the tissues, and then there's a secondary injury. A lot of these processes that we focus on the ICU, hypoglycemia, hypoxemia, decreased brain oxygenation, which may or may not be related to systemic oxygenation because 
uh, sometimes the brain is a bit more susceptible and decreased brain uh, uh, blood flow and perfusion. And as we move, we go over towards rehabilitation, uh, like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, mobilization, feeding, and sleep. Uh, well, we're talking about these critically injured patients. Why are we talking about rehabilitation? Well, it's the end goal. Well, the end goal is you know, them to be back to how they were in living their lives, um, and functionally independent and normal. But really, a lot of rehabilitation is now moved in to the hospital and is moved into the ICU. Uh, no longer do we wait weeks before mobilizing a patient with stroke. Physical therapy, occupational therapy starts the next day after the stroke. Right? Speech therapy is related to, and feeding is related to aspiration pneumonia. Uh, mobilizing the patients in any mobility is, is the cornerstone of what we do for preventing uh, DVTs and pulmonary embolism. So rehabilitation and these services that were previously viewed as part of rehabilitation and early mobilization is really part of what we do in the ICU now as well, as secondary, prevention of secondary. So if you want to talk a little bit more and, and, and drill down on some more of these things, some of the primary injury that kind of moves on to secondary injury are things like permeation, ongoing ischemia, um, and we mentioned uh, all the, the secondary injuries they want to, to, to reduce. What about supporting organ systems? There's cardiac effects, pulmonary effects, often there's skin integrity and infection issues that our patients we run into. And in particular, DVT prophylaxis and early mobilization is important, as well as GI stress alteration. Um, and again, that, that kind of matter of early but safe rehabilitation. So what are the conditions that we deal with? The commonest conditions in the ICU, we have ischemic stroke. That's one of the, the commonest conditions that you're going to see in the neuro ICU. Um, most patients with ischemic stroke don't end up in the ICU, thankfully. They don't have severe enough injuries to be in the ICU. However, uh, our sickest stroke patients do need ICU care, and stroke is a very common condition. So there's patients with large vessel occlusion stroke. So these are patients that may, uh, hopefully most of them should receive stroke thrombectomy. Um, and, and these are our sickest stroke patients. Some of them will also receive uh, thrombolytics. We also have our patients that receive thrombolytics, and they have a very large range. Some of them are very mild strokes, and some of them are very severe strokes. We also have hemorrhagic stroke, which has multiple subtypes intercerebral hemorrhage or interparenchymal hemorrhage, which is with the hemorrhage within the substance of the brain. So arachnoid hemorrhage is the hemorrhage on the surface of the brain. That's usually due to a ruptured aneurysm. Um, another consequence of subarachnoid hemorrhage is in a later phase of their injury, while still in the ICU, the patients may develop cerebral vasospasm, and that has another consequence. Um, and there's also interventricular hemorrhage, and the hemorrhage uh, really seeps into the ventricular system and that can lead to hydrocephalus and, and further comorbidities. And they may coexist with the other types of hemorrhage. So there are some patients that you'll see that have multiple compartment hemorrhages. Um, other neuro ICU conditions uh, or conditions we see in the neuro ICU are brain tumors. And they can be within the parenchyma of the brain or on the surface of the brain. So intraaxial or extraaxial tumors. Pituitary tumors which need different management because there's a lot of hormonal effects in um, brain trauma, uh, so this is neurotrauma, subdural hematoma, diffuse axonal injury, epidural hematomas, and traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Also, uh, part of neurotrauma is spinal cord injury uh, and management of spinal cord injury. That's another base topic. Status epilepticus is something that you already see in the medical ICU population, but you'll see also in the neuro ICU because their patients are more prone to doing seizures. Um, and then uh, neuro patients with neuromuscular disease, uh, like Guillain-Barre syndrome or myasthenic graphis, which have a different way of ma managing uh, their neurological injury, because they don't have a central nervous system disorder, it's a peripheral nervous system disorder. So they have different needs. Um, today we're going to mainly focus on the ischemics and hemorrhagic stroke side of things, because that's the biggest round for intervention. I think it's the, also the commonest patients that we see in the neuro ICU, so it gives you a good feel of what the ICU is like. So, moving, that's a big overview. We are going to move on to our assessment. So, the bedside nursing assessment uh, starts with neurochecks. That's the cornerstone. You see that in every order and every patient in the neuro ICU. Um, also, there's more specific scales like the NIH stroke scale and uh, the Glasgow Coma scale. 
Um, all of these scales of neuro checks, the stroke scale and the Glasgow Coma scale, are really modifications of the neurological examination. So having a working knowledge of the neurological examination can help you sometimes in making a little bit of extra assessment for patients in certain situations and to pick up things that are not uh, picked up by these scales. And the last thing is integrating the pressure monitoring. This is the kind of um, first thing that people think about when they think about a neuro ICU, like, oh, they have monitors in the brain, right? Because that makes it seem more neurological. Uh, and it is a very specialized thing, so it's not done in other ICUs, uh, generally speaking. Um, but really, the most focus is the, the actual the skills and the bedside care and the nursing that you do rather than just the monitor. Um, but we'll talk about the, the, the ICP pressure monitor. So we'll go over neurochecks first. Um, neurochecks are different depending on which hospital you're in and what kind of uh, setting you're practicing. Um, the hospitals have generally in each unit their own standards for what is part of the neurochecks. But there are certain things that are common to all of them. So assessment of level of consciousness. A level of consciousness means how awake is the patient. If you're alert and bright and, and you know, uh, attentive, then the patient's alert. Um, hopefully not by the end of this lecture or maybe after the lecture. <laughs> Some of us are gonna be a little bit lethargic. Um, uh, that's a patient that's, they're awake, right? But they're not completely sharp. They're not completely attentive. They fall asleep easily. They need a little bit of stimulus to keep them engaged. And they'll get distracted very quickly. Uh, then you have the obtunded stuporous patient. I kind of put obtunded and stuporous together because nowadays we, we put them together because it's, it's a little bit difficult to discern which is stuporous and which is obtunded. We end up getting into, into areas where uh, our, our inter-rated reliability, our reliability between multiple people measuring things is not, not that great. And these are patients that are more than just lethargic. They're not completely comatose yet, but they're pretty severely impaired with regards to their level of consciousness. They require a lot of stimulus to get them to open up their eyes and engage and respond to stimulus. Comatose patients are patients who can't get them to wake up. Their eyes are closed, they may have different posturing, they may not have movement, they may have focal deficits, they may not have focal deficits, but they're in this state where even with a lot of stimulus they don't wake up and open their eyes and engage you. Um, so that's what we assess when we assess level of consciousness, and that's part of every neuro check. Um, we also assess orientation, that's, you know, does the patient know where they are, who they are, what time it is, and what the context is. Are they oriented time, place, person? In some, some situations, we'll talk about situation. Do they know what's going on exactly? Uh, so A no times three or A no times four, we see that written sometimes. Pupil checks are part of the neuro checks. Um, you examine the paper, patients, you want to see if their pupils equal, are they round, are they reactive to light. Um, accommodation, we don't tend to test that much in the ICU, but definitely pupils equal, round, and reactive to light. That's a corner story, you're going to measure it. And there's this pupil gauge that you use. Uh, you can either use it in the, in the old days when we just had this big sheet that you have all your neuro checks on, it's on the sheet often. Uh, nowadays, people have it on their pen, or you can just have a, a a clinical assessment of you think it's two millimeters, three millimeters, four millimeters. You get pretty good at that. You want to track is the patient's pupil, are the patient's pupil changing? Right? It's a change in the pupil, the change in the neurological exam, change in the level of consciousness, that's the most important thing. Right? Think of this as your O2 sat monitor and the patient with ARDS, or your blood pressure monitor and, monitor and your patient who's in septic shock, or your urine output with somebody that you're resuscitating. Uh, these are the measures that let you know how is the patient doing neurologically. Um, so uh, facial symmetry, ask the patient to smile, lift their eyebrows, you want to see are, is their face symmetric or not, is there, is there any change in the face, facial symmetry. Clarity of speech, the patient's response to touch and pain, uh, grasp, strength, squeeze my fingers. And this is one of the things that's a little bit different depending on which hospital you're in. Usually there's just some measure of strength and movement in, in the arms bilaterally. Um, other institutions may ask you to do drift, which is kind of part of our stroke scale. They ask the patient to lift their arm up, see does one side drift up, are they able to maintain it consistently. Um, for more subtle things, you may actually see if can the patient pull you and push you. So that's where I think neurochecks get a little bit different. 
But the basics is going to be a level of consciousness. You're going to be assessing orientation, you're going to be assessing pupils, and you're going to do some assessment of motor activity by that. Um, and it's performed either once an hour, uh, once every two hours, once every three hours, or four hours. And I see you really reading between Q1 hour and Q3 hours for these measures. Um, and it's because that's how we monitor our patients. You know? There is no O2 sat monitor for the brain. Well, no one that works great. So um, uh, this is what, what we do to this. Uh, and you have to compare it with previous. You want to see is there a change. So this is level of consciousness again, just to, to, to talk about again. You have alert, lethargic, tundid and stuporous, and then comatose. Going from response immediately, fully to visual, auditory, and verbal stimulation, and tactile stimulation, versus patient that uh, falls asleep, is drowsy, um, uh, is easy to out, which has, responds very, it's very light stimulus, but falls asleep uh, pretty quickly uh, if you don't stimulate the patient. And then you have the offended patient that's very difficult to arouse, but does arouse. Whereas patients that are comatose, they don't arouse. They may have no response or posture. So a little bit, some institutions, and sometimes they may ask you to do neuro checks, but focus on arm drift as well. Uh, and this is typical for our patients with vasospasm. And, uh, that, that's a, quick, a, a very common way we, we, we regard it. Do neuro checks, but also assess arm drift. Uh, and then you look at checking the drift in the arm, and the strength in the arm, and drift in the leg, and the strength in the leg. Because we're looking for a little bit more subtle changes in these patients. So what about the other scales? I'm not going to talk about the neuro uh, NIH stroke scale, because it's beyond the scope of this presentation, but really what it is is a neurological examination broke down, broken down and focused on stroke and to pick, detect big changes in stroke patients. That's what it was developed for. It was developed in the first TPA trials to give us a measure, an objective measure, is, is the patient deteriorating? Which patient do we need to scan to see if they have an intracranial hemorrhage or not? How do we detect if the patient's deteriorating or if the current hemorrhage is symptomatic or asymptomatic? That's why the scale was developed and now we use it in practice to monitor our stroke patients. So depending on your protocol, it may be Q15 minutes after TPA and then go down to Q1 hour, and it kind of depends on, on the institutional protocol. Um, there's an online training for it to learn how to do it so that your measurement is as reliable as mine, as reliable as the next person. The Glasgow Coma Scale, again, cornerstone of neurological assessment. You're gonna score three things, the patients Eye opening, the patient's verbal response, and the patient's motor response. And each of these things, the lowest number can be one. So the lowest number for the patient is going to be three. The highest number is 15. And um, it, you know, there's various different steps. What you do to the patient is you observe the patient first, then you talk to the patient, then you give them gentle stimulus. And if they, they're not 15 at that stage, you give them painful stimulus to see what they do. Uh, so some patients are going to have their eyes open spontaneously, some people will only open it when you give them pain. So other patients won't open it, even if you give them pain. For movement, the patient may have purposeful spontaneous movements, or they may have different posturing as well. And uh, the same thing with speech. For patients who are intubated, we write T to indicate that they're intubated. So the patient will be like a GCS of 3T instead of 3, or 6T. And it's a good measure, it tells us about disease severity when they first come in. It's a very easy way to communicate. It was one of our first scales that allowed us to go beyond just the pupil check and level of consciousness, but also to give it a, a, a more um, a granular uh, assessment of um, is the patient getting better, getting worse. It's very reproducible, and that's probably our first scale that was used in ICU. Uh, and then we developed the, neuro, the stroke scale for our TPA and stroke thrombectomy patients. So those are these three. These three are the are, 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 are commonest measures in the ICU. Uh, almost all ICUs will have neurotex and GCS for all patients, and then some patients will also get a stroke scale. That's generally how things how things work. Um, and you'll be recording that in your sheet. Now it's an actual. The neurological examination has the components of all these things we talked about. Yeah, this has the level of consciousness, it has language and speech assessment, which is part of the stroke scale, right? Or yeah, the stroke scale takes this part out. Um, there's eye movements assessment. You want to see the eyes conjugate, are they moving together, or are the patient's, is the patient disconjugate, are they cross eyed 
Does that could indicate brainstem injury or other injuries. Um, one assess cough, gag, cornea reflex. These are things that sometimes we'll be assessing in addition to uh, the, the regular assessments that the patients are, are getting. Finger and nose testing for, for ataxia. So these are a little bit more subtle signs, a little bit more things that you may want to do in your patient to assess or you may pick up in your patient and then that may alert you that something is going on. For example, if you have a deeply comatose patient that suddenly loses their cough and gag, that patient is getting worse. And to create the pressure monitoring, well, there's two ways of monitoring. One, what we talked about already. It's an indirect measure of intracranial pressure. Now, it's an indirect measure of a lot of other things. There's more than just ICP, right? Um, in fact, most of what we do in the neuro ICU is not ICP related. Um, it's uh, really preventing secondary injury, detecting early deterioration. Uh, and that you do by the neurologic exam. Also, patients that raise ICP, there can be indirect consequences that you detect on the examination. When ICP goes high, the GCS is going to go down, there may be some pupil changes if the patient starts to herniate, etc., etc. Or there's direct measurement by invasive monitors. Generally speaking, there's two types of invasive monitors, ventriculostomies, known as external ventricular veins. Sometimes they call them ventrix. And then there's also ICP monitors that don't drain fluid. Right. These are the ones that go direct, they both go into, into the brain. The ventriculostomy is a tube that goes into this chamber, we'll talk about later on, and you see the fluid coming out. So you can drain fluid and measure, whereas the ICP monitor, the device that just gets stuck into the brain, that's a device that's stuck into the brain and you just ma measure. You can't take fluid out, you're just measuring the pressure. Um, the external ventricular drain, you record the ICP every hour. Um, so you clamp it off to the patient and onto the transducer, record the ICP and then put it back to where it was. Um, and you record the output every hour. Now if the HEVD is, is, is ordered to be closed and clamped the whole time, there's not going to be any output, but you're getting ICP measurements. If it's ordered to be open, then you record the output every hour in the chart, um, and you clamp it temporarily just to measure the ICP, and then you open it up at the correct level that it's supposed to be. And that way, by the end of the day, you have exactly how much output the patient had for the whole day and when that output occurred. You also have an ICP trend for the whole day. Also, during that day or during the shift, you can see there's a chain. If there's a change, you may require some intervention. Raised ICP is an ICP greater than 20 centimeters of water. That's how we measure it, pressure by centimeters of water for three to five minutes. Some institutions use three minutes, some institutions use five minutes. Why isn't it any raised ICP? It turns out that if you cough, if you strain, uh, if patient coughs and strains, or if they have a change in position, ICP can temporarily go above 20. So these transient things we, we don't think in most patients are consequential, so they may not merit an intervention. Like if the patient coughs for three seconds and the ICP goes to 24 and then goes back down, you're not going to give the patient mannitol or change their EVD. Um, but if it's persistently greater than 20, 20, uh, 20 for three minutes or, or five minutes, then these patients, you need to alert the team and they need interventions. That for these patients. On the other hand, this also highlights that in patients that are critical, right? Uh, for example, and the analogy would be your patient in sepsis, right? Your patient's in septic shock, multiple pressors. If that patient, you would get to give him a dose of metoprolol, that may push them over the edge, right? Uh, so you're gonna see that metoprolol where you're like, really, this is patient in septic shock, are we gonna give metoprolol? You're gonna tell the team, that's something wrong. So some of our patients who are in ICP crisis, things like coughing, straining, changing in position, may actually put them all over the edge. So these are, are very sick patients that in, sometimes you see us say, keep them sedated, limiting coughing, and limiting any, uh, any painful stimulation for them. Majority of our patients though, in the neuro ICU, we wanna keep them as awake as possible. Because our assessment is, the neurological examination, you want it to, have, to be as accurate as possible. Plus it turns out, the more awake the patient is, the more mobile they are, the less complications they get from immobility. The DVTs, the pneumonias. So it's kind of a change in the philosophy. However, rarely you will see some of these patients that are in ICP crisis 
where we're going to put them, avoid coughing, avoid stimulus, and you can see us putting them on opiates as well just to suppress the cough. Um, so the goals for raising to cranial pressure, uh, you want the ICP to be less than 20. You don't want it to be high. Most of us run between 8 and 15 most of the time. Um, uh, it, we think it becomes dangerous when it gets above 20. And if you know that our map, our goal is the goal of map usually is greater than 65 for most of our patients. That's what keeps the brain perfused. And if you subtract it, map of 65 minus the ICP, right? So that gives you 45. And that's kind of the perfusion pressure the patients get right? uh, to their brain. And you want the goal CPP to be around 50. Um, so if somebody has a raised ICP, you may see us asking for a map that's greater than that to compensate for that. If the patient has a stenosis that's not letting that map get all the way and translate into a severe perfusion pressure, then you may see us increase the systemic map and say we want a map of 90 because there's a narrowing in the internal carotid artery and this intracranially and this flow is not getting into the brain. That happens in vasospasm. Uh, and uh, sometimes you have raised ICP and the narrowing, so then it becomes even more difficult. So these are some of the hemodynamic management that we do to maintain perfusion to the brain. Now there's systemic consequences to that. If you're gonna try to keep the patient's map at 100 or 90 for a long period of time and the patient has coronary artery disease, or if the patient has already developed a non-STEMI or a stunned myocardium, which they may develop from their neurological injury anyway, systemic effect, then it gets tricky and you have competing, competing goals. Uh, and that's where we may have different targets for the patients. Uh, but the general concept is you want the, generally speaking, the ICP to be less than 20, generally speaking, the perfusion pressure to be around 50, generally speaking, the NAP to be greater than 65. But we make adjustments for the patient. So how do we treat raised intracranial pressure? Well, it kind of depends on what the condition that caused it. These are the different steps, but it really depends. In certain conditions, surgical intervention like hemicraniectomy or craniotomies may be up at step number one or step number two. Other conditions, it may be the last step. But things that we do are keeping the head of bed up greater than 30 degrees, sometimes even higher than that. Um, Deep analgesia and sedation often in our patients that are in ICP crisis. Ventriculostomy uh, and CSF drainage. They may open the ventriculostomy to drain, they keep it open at 10. Or they may say drain 5 cc's off the ventriculostomy. That would very quickly reduce the ICP and then put it open at 10. Um, we may ask for hyperosmolar therapy, mannitol or uh, hypertonic saline, like 3% saline or 23% saline. Um, Hyperventilation is a step that works. So it's actually one of the quickest ways to, to reduce ICP. What happens is you hyperventilate the patient, you reduce their CO2 to around 30. The reduction in CM2 causes an acid base change in the brain, which causes the blood vessels to uh, contract, constrict. And that reduces the amount of blood in, inside the, the cranial cavity, so there's more room. So the ICP goes down. It's a temporary effect but it works very quickly. So often, if somebody is in a crisis, we say hyperventilate them while you're getting the mantle, while you're sedating them, and we're doing these one, two, three steps together to get ICP under control. So often we're doing it while we're on the way to the operating room, or just then we'll wait and see if the patient deteriorates, then we'll go to the operating room. These are often the things that work. Again, detection of this phase ICP may be clinical or maybe by one. So what are the triggers? A trigger, the, probably the most important trigger is a change in the neurological exam, and that's our commonest trigger. Um, decreased level of consciousness, dilated pupil, unequal pupil, or change in the pupil, disconjugate gaze, new weakness, high ICP if you have a monitor, inability to maintain parameters, and then maybe ICP parameters or vital signs parameters. The patient was doing fine, now suddenly his blood pressure shot up, or suddenly the patient became bradycardic. That may be a sign that something's going on neurologically with the patient. Not only just systemically. Or yeah, the pressure requirements are going up and up and up. I have to increase the pressures all. Uh, I'm going up, I'm maxing out on uh, norepinephrine, I'm st starting a phenylephrine drip. That may be a trigger, hey, 
I need to let the team know maybe something is going on here that is different. Something is changing in the patient's physiology. The interventions, it may be surgical intervention, maybe endovascular intervention, the intervention procedures. Maybe ICU interventions like blood pressure augmentation, intubation, central line, medications, including vasoactive medications and hyperosmolar therapy. We may ask for further tests, maybe an indication that the patient needs a stat CT scan or CT angiography or perfusion scan, or the patient may need an MRI or an EEG. Uh, they may need anti -epileptic. So these are the kind of interventions that we'll be doing for the patients and the kind of triggers that you're watching for. So that kind of covers the general overview for uh, the new ICU and how we take care of uh, uh, patients and monitor these patients in general. Um, we're going to talk now about the new intervention procedures and really the, the main conditions because we're going to talk about ischemic stroke and we're going to talk about um, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, but first, let's talk about some of the elective neuro interventional procedures, because it kind of gives us a feel of, of uh, the basic care for this. So the first one is the elective diagnostic angiography, which really is an outpatient procedure. Uh, however, in the neuro ICU, a lot of your patients are going to be getting these, this procedure, so you will, you will receive them and need to know how to take care of them. So after uh, any procedure, you want to monitor the patient's vital signs. Typically, we'll also include neuro checks for a couple of times for these patients, depending on the protocol. Um, we often do a bedside swallow screen or dysphagia screen because any patient that we do a neurointerventional procedure on, one of the complications is stroke and you want to make sure you can the patient swallow properly before you feed them. Um, and then we do the neuro checks in our institution here, Q1 hour times two, then Q2 hours times one, then per unit standards. Um, and we do the same thing for our patients before we send them. Uh, peripheral pulse check, depending on if we do femoral artery access or radial access, most cerebral angiography is done with the femoral route. Um, so you'll be checking this uh, catheterization site and uh, the peripheral pulses, comparing the peripheral pulses if they're absent or they, they need to be done by Doppler instead of uh, clinically by direct palpation to what was found before the procedure. If there's any change, that's another detail. And then we give at least one liter of IV fluids afterwards just to clear out the contrast and, and, and make sure that we protect the kidneys. Um, flat time ranges from two to three to six hours, uh, depending on what closure device was used and whether it was successful. Uh, for brachial access or radial access procedures, we follow our closure device uh, or however we close the protocol. So here we often use a TR band for radial access, and there's a protocol that we have in our um, so that cerebral angiography checks apply to all of our neuroendovascular procedures. So anybody that gets thrombectomy or coiling or other endovascular procedures, that's going to be part of it. So for aneurysm coiling, it's elective aneurysm coiling. And this is an aneurysm here that we treat with a flow diverting device. So the aneurysm disappears on follow up. There's another aneurysm here that was actually ruptured, an ECOM aneurysm that we end up putting coils into the aneurysm while preserving the artery. Um, so it has the same post-procedure care as diagnostic cerebral angiography, except usually we like to keep the blood pressure less than 140 overnight, and then afterwards at the patient records. In vasospat, in, in subarachnoid hemorrhage, we have slightly different parameters. Uh, the patient may need a heparin drip depending on how the procedure went and, and whether there were any technical issues during the procedure. Um, uh, bedside swallow screen, dysphagia swallow screen before the patient's about to eat. Um, and then PT and OT can start right after the bed rest period is over. We're not doing prolonged demobilization of these patients. As soon as their bed rest period for their um, femoral arteriotomy is, is over, they can start ambulating and participating. Um, arterial venous fistulas and arterial venous malformations are some of our more complex cerebrovascular disorders. And this is an example of one where you see the internal carotid artery and you see these large veins that are draining early in the arterial phase. Normally, you're supposed to see the arteries, and then later the capillaries, and then later on the veins, and the veins are supposed to be normal size. We have a very quick filling of the veins because there's a shunt. The brain is being bypassed, the artery goes directly into, into the vein. Here it goes through this tiny tangle of vessels called an APM, or an IPS. This is arterial venous malformation. So doing embolization procedures for this, we'll go through either the arterial side or the venous side, and we go to the connection, and we deposit embolic material. 
That can cause a lot of changes in flow within the AVM, which can have consequences, including uh, like the cranial hemorrhage, and it can also, the procedure itself may cause perforation, may cause ischemic stroke. So you can see that we're watching for afterwards, and we'd like to try to prevent that. So same as for diagnostic angiography, the same initial um, uh, preparation uh, or post-procedure care, but we may have very strict blood pressure control these patients. We have less than 140 or even sometimes less than 120 overnight because there's so many like, hemodynamic changes. Sometimes these patients may require a heparin drip and then afterwards you want to check them to make sure they're swallowing adequately before they eat. And again, early mobilization and early physical therapy. Ischemic stroke post TPA, I think most of the uh, of us in the room is taking, have taken care of these patients. We're going to do our night stroke scale and our neuro checks per protocol. The blood pressure parameter for post TPA is less than 180 systolic, and the diastolic less than 100, because we want the patient to allow the patient to perfuse. Um, at the same time, you want to um, make sure it doesn't go too high. This is the vessel occluded, and this is what the vessel looks like after it's recanalized. It's actually a thrombectomy case, but the same principle applies. Um, no antiplatelets, no anticoagulation for 24 hours until we inside the post-procedure CT scan 24 hours later, and we've reviewed the scan and made sure there's no hemorrhage on it. Uh, peripheral IV is okay. Foley catheter may be okay, but we try to avoid placing Foley catheters in our stroke patients anyway. And we've moved to a process where we don't do Foley catheters before giving TVA, and we don't do it before thrombectomy, and we try to avoid Foley catheters in all of our stroke patients if we can. There's going to be a small number of patients who do need it. So I'm probably known as part of the Foley police. Um, <laughs> and it makes the nursing much harder. There's no way about it, around it. It's much more difficult to take care of a patient that doesn't have a Foley catheter. But for the majority of the patients, it's safer. There are patients that will need Foley catheters, so we realize it. Okay. The practicality of it. Um, and if we assess the patient, we can insert the Foley catheter in a later stage. And then after you've inserted, the same way as after inserting anything into the patient, whether it's a central line, a ventriculostomy, or an ET tube, this first thing we do after putting it in is deciding when can we take it out. And you just you ask yourself that question every day. Um, and we avoid NG2 for 24 hours after, after TP. Um, and uh, prevent aspiration pneumonia. That's a key thing in stroke and key, key thing in patients that are neurologically injured is preventing aspiration pneumonia. Before hospitals, before medical care, actually quite a while after hospitals and medical care has persisted, the main problem after neurological injury is patient without pneumonia. And then the second problem is consequences of immobility and the complications of pain. And then there's a specific cranial stuff like the raised ICP, the herniation, but the systemic stuff, in particular pneumonia, immobility, and infection are, are, are really the cornerstones of things that we can do. So stroke in general, um, to kind of go over some of the evidence, uh, it's a disabling condition. Yes, about 10 to 15% of our patients with stroke will, will die, but the majority of patients will survive stroke. And about 40% of survivors of stroke, stroke will, be, will have some form of disability. Now disability can range, and quality of life is not a, do you have quality of life or do you have poor quality of life? My quality of life right now is good. My quality of life this morning when my alarm clock rang was not that great. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so it changes, right? Um, on vacation, my quality of life is fantastic. Uh, and the same thing occurs for patients. Sometimes after a stroke, they'll have mild disability. So yes, it's not as good as it was before, but they have a reasonable quality of life and they enjoy their lives and they can still be active and do what they want to do. So that modified ranking skill gives us a, a crude, large global measure of what quality of life is like. Not quality of life, but disability is like after a stroke. And that's related to quality of life. So it goes from zero to six. Six is death. Zero is completely normal. And there are big jumps in between. So if we go from six to five, five is bedridden, incontinent, needs help with everything. Um, that is a state where a lot of people would say is worse than death. And when we talk about end of life, this is some of the things that we're thinking about. Um, the next step from that is a modified ranking scale of four, where the patient is not completely bedridden, but can't walk on their own. So they need assistance walking. And that's a big jump from a five. It's still bad. You still don't want to wish it on anyone. It's still what we consider a poor outcome. 
And it's variable on, for the patient whether they consider that worth going through rehabilitation or not. That's a personal choice. Um, they're all personal choices, but here the personal choice plays a lot into it. A modified ranking scale of three is moderate, moderately severe, uh, severe disability, or moderate disability, sorry, moderate disability. Um, and this is a patient that uh, requires help with activities of daily. You can't leave that patient alone for several days, um, but they can ambulate without assistance. And as you know from taking care of the patient, taking care of a patient that can ambulate without assistance versus taking care of a patient that needs help with assistance, there's a big difference. This is a big jump. And now if you think about modified ranking scale of four, like, okay, so this is a patient that needs help with ambulation. How many stroke patients have I seen that needs help with ambulation and activity of daily living, but still have a reasonable quality of life, right? So even within that modified ranking scale of four, there's a big gradient, right? Um, same thing within the three. The next big jump is modified rank of scale of two. This is a patient you can leave for a week at a, at, at a time without helping them. So they're functionally independent. They may not be going back to work. They may not be doing their finances, or the complicated finances, the basic finances. They may not be going to do all their hobbies, but they're functionally independent. Now, if you move somebody from modified rank of scale of four to a two, that's a big thing. Um, modified ranking scale of one is near normal. The patient has a deficit but can do everything they can do before. Work, uh, hobbies, activities, daily living, independence, everything. Uh, but they have a deficit. They may have a dysarthria, they may have a facial palsy, they may have some numbness, they may have some ataxia, but they can do everything they want to do. So we talk about zero to one is functionally normal, zero to two is functionally independent. And then, you know, um, uh, zero to three is somebody that can ambulate on the system. So that's a key slide because we're going to talk about some of these outcomes. So TPA versus time. If we do TPA for our patients very early, we have a much, much higher chance of getting the patients have a good outcome, meaning lower modified banking scale, less disability. And at every time point, up to four and a half hours, the TPA arm has more patients in the lower number of uh, modified ranking scales, so less disability compared to the placebo arm. But as you can see, even by looking at these bars, the lo longer we wait to give TPA, the less effect it has. So it's a time dependent thing. Um, large vessel occlusion and thrombectomy, this is uh, actually the same picture from before, but this is actually what happened the patient, and we did a mechanical thrombectomy. You see the thrombus attached to our devices, and you can analyze the blood vessel. We want to do the same post procedure care as uh, after the angiogram. Uh, check the pulses peripherally, check the axis side, mirror check, stroke scale, same as any stroke patient. Our blood pressure goals are variable. They may be similar to the post TPA goals, or if we get complete recanalization, often we require them to be no normal. We want to get them their blood pressure really low and less avoid hypertension because we don't want them to run into the complications of intracranial hemorrhage. Um, if TPA was given, you have the post-CPA uh, requirements, no antiplasis, no anticoagulates in addition to that. Uh, and you avoid no compressible function. And again, the cornerstone of any stroke patient's care, avoid aspiration pneumonia, early mobilization after the plan. Um, these are the endovascular stroke tiles. So these are the, the, the main positive ones that changed how we, we take care of patients. So we take patients pretty early within their strokes, within the first six to eight hours. Uh, they, these are all patients that had um, internal carotid artery and middle cerebral artery occlusion, large vessel occlusions detected on CT angiography. And we randomized them to stent retriever thrombectomy versus IV TPA. And we looked at the modified ranking scale in 90 days, and we looked at the modified ranking scale shift. Shift meaning somebody went from a four to a three, or from a three to a, sorry, uh, or three to a two, or, or went from a four to a two, or two and one. And um, improvement in our uh, modified rank and scale or functional independence was um, much more commoner in the endovascular arm than in the TPA arm. Sorry, in the, in the TPA arm. And there was no increase in symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage and no increase in death. Uh, so these are the studies that uh, prove, uh, prove that stent retrieval thrombectomy is substantially better than medical therapy alone for these patients. So that's why you're going to have some patients 
large vessel occlusion stroke, you get TPA and thrombectomy, and some patients you get thrombectomy alone. Whereas the patients who don't have a large vessel occlusion, they either are not going to get TPA or they're going to get TPA. So that's kind of how you see the mixture of patients. And these are our secret stroke patients. These are some other studies that also confirm the same findings, and some of these studies also use CT perfusion. Same results here. And this is a, a graphical um, representation from my, my colleague, Dr. Taleb, who's like, yes, then you need only two, like, two slides. Uh, tell them what you're going to tell them, and then show them what the results are. <laughs> <laughs> and then open it for questions. Um, and this is TPA within three hours. We benefit one out of eight patients. They go back to normal or near normal, one of our events because you to one. Uh, if we, for the patient to present later, the benefit is less significant, but it's there. For endovascular therapy, these are sicker patients. We benefit between one in four or one in seven patients. Overall, if you take all the endovascular therapy trials together, we actually number need to treat as three patients, two point something, uh, to benefit one patient by increasing them to functional dependence. Um, so these are highly effective therapies, however, we still end up with patients with disability. We still end up with patients with disability. These patients are going to need rehabilitation, they're going to need our care, they're going to need um, uh, us to optimize uh, uh, their outcomes. And majority of these patients are going to survive. And they're going to be somewhere on those modified Rankin scales. Maybe in the ICU when you're seeing them, they're modified Rankin scale of four or five, but at three months recovery, they get down to a three or two. So um, that's kind of the framework really look at our patients. Uh, this is a chain of survival, fast, face, arm, speech, and time. Uh, see the stroke signs, act quickly, activate the ambulance, go to the hospital, receive a revascularization of therapy, whether it's TPA, thrombectomy, or both, and then improve the recovery and function. And this is where we, the ICU part marries these two. Sometimes the ICU part is involved in the TPA administration of our patients. So patients. Uh, stroke complication prevention and treatment. So what are the neurologic and systemic complications? Recurrent or worsening stroke, cerebral edema and herniation from cerebral edema, intracranial hemorrhage, which may be symptomatic or asymptomatic. If it's asymptomatic, we don't want it to become symptomatic. If it's symptomatic, we want to try to reduce the effects of the, of, of the, of the secondary injury. Uh, seizures can occur. They don't need routine prophylaxis for seizures, but if the patient has seizures, we need to treat them and detect them. Um, uh, paralysis, aphasia, dysphagia, the consequences of that. So we want to do neuro checks, blood pressure control, glycemic control, fever control, and early rehabilitation. For the systemic complications of aspiration pneumonia, uh, deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, urinary tract infection, it requires diligent, protocolized work. The swallow screen, yeah. Patient failed the swallow screen, we follow protocol, we don't break protocol. Yeah, they're hungry, it's not nice, but we have to do it. We want to prevent aspiration pneumonia. Remember, our goal is zero with aspiration pneumonia. Um, and we're doing a good job when we're very diligent with our aspiration with their, their screens. DBT prophylaxis, non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic, depending on how safe it is. Foley avoidance and early removal of foley gatherers. And that's a lot of hard work. Um, and early mobilization. These are the things that prevent some of these systemic complications. And putting these things together actually leads to better outcomes. In fact, the nursing care involved in stroke units and these interventions uh, cause a reduction in mortality in stroke patients even before the era of TPA, even before the era of thrombectomy. And in fact, what stroke units, the reduction that they get in mortality is mainly due to this nursing care. It's not glamorous. But these interventions are actually what get the patients better. TPA adds a little bit more, and thrombectomy adds a little bit more for our sickest patients. Uh, it can be substantial for our sickest patients. But this basic care is what gets our population as a whole healthier and recovering better. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, now the other big disease that we're going to focus on. And then it's going to get a little bit lighter because we'll just uh, talk about the ventriculostomy uh, So at the whole we're at the kind of crux of the lecture, and then it's going to get to the home stretch. <laughs> so, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, there's kind of view of it as multiple phases. So, this patient, we're talking about aneurysm of subarachnoid hemorrhage, where the patient has an aneurysm that ruptures. And then there's a consequence of the rupture. The blood in the vein, in the, in the, around the brain, may actually be into the brain, causing intercerebral hemorrhage, may be inside the ventricle, causing hydrocephalus as well. 
So we need to resuscitate the patient adequately up front. Do they need airway management? Do they need a ventricular the ICP drain? We need to keep the blood pressure down so they don't re-rupture the aneurysm. And then as soon as we stabilize or resuscitate the patient, they may be found down and dehydrated, they may need fluids, they may be hypoxemic, they may be hyperglycemic. And then as soon as we resuscitate the patient, we want to secure the aneurysm very quickly so that the patient doesn't re-rupture. After the aneurysm is secure, then we want to deal with the consequences of all the secondary things that can occur. Vasospasm, status epilepticus, aspiration pneumonia, DVTs, stunned myocardium, pulmonary edema. So we end up with these different phases. Before the aneurysm is secured, and our goal is controlling ICP, resuscitation, um, getting the patient ready for the, um, the procedure. Then closing the, uh, the aneurysm, um, securing the aneurysm either by endovascular means for the majority of our patients or surgical means. And then we want to monitor and treat cerebral vasospasm and the medical complications. That's the ICU kind of post, post securing the aneurysm phase where the patient is going to spend a lot of time in the ICU. And they can get very sick from both the systemic complications or from the vasospasm. So there's a lot of active work and monitoring for the patients in this. In addition to what we do with our ischemic stroke patients we're running to stage of swallowing and early mobilization. And then transition to rehabilitation. So, overview what we do, neuro ICU admission, sorry this slide is very small. Uh, treatment of hydrocephalus, securing the aneurysm, and vasospasm. Those are the three things. Not everybody's gonna need a drain. Not everybody's gonna develop vasospasm. Well, almost all of the patients were going to secure their aneurysm. Keep the head of bed greater than 30 degrees because that prevents aspiration pneumonia and also helps with ICP. NPO strictly until we do the dysphagious wall screen and make sure that it's safe to give them anything. Uh, baseline EKG for these patients because there can be cardiac consequences to the adrenergic surge after the aneurysm ruptures. The ICP was high, the, um, it is a massive release of adrenaline in these patients. More so than we see with ischemic stroke or anti-cerebral hemorrhage, other types of anti-cerebral hemorrhage. Um, in some institutions, they do routine cardiography. We do a selective echocardiography. If the patient has raised troponins or if the patient has hemodynamic consequences, then we do an echo um, to detect stunned myocardium. Basically, it's a condition where the heart stops pumping as well. The ejection fraction goes very low because of this uh, reaction to the adrenergic surge, uh, the, muscle, the muscles contract and then they end up in a contracted state. You can't, uh, can't um, uh, function well. Uh, we monitor the patients by neurological examination, neuro checks, uh, GCS, as we mentioned before, vitals and oximetry, EKG monitoring, fluid balance is important in these patients, and we monitor the patient's sodium. For neuroprotection, we give them nemodipine and we maintain euvolemia. The goal for these patients is euvolemia. Not hypervolemia, not hypovolemia, but euvolemia. And it can be tricky sometimes, because some of these patients develop pulmonary edema, develop uh, CHF, and we have to take care of that. We secure the aneurysm by coiling or clipping. DBT prophylaxis after the aneurysm is secure, because these patients are at risk of immobility in DBTs. And they've just had a hemorrhage, so they actually end up in a hypercoagulable state afterwards. But after the aneurysm is secured, they can start the pharmacological. Um, a GI prophylax is usually administered. And in selected patients, we do cardiac enzymes, cardiac output monitoring, CBP monitoring, continuous EEG monitoring, and geography for vasospasm. And here we do routine TCDs in all of our vasospasm, uh, or in all of our subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. So, what are the complications? Re bleeding, that's why we re secure the aneurysm, hydrocephalus, and vasospasm. Those are the commonest three neurological complications. Vasospasm is closely related to delayed cerebral ischemia and stroke infarction. They see a type of stroke the patient gets after. So they get their hemorrhage, and then a few days later, they develop ischemic strokes. Um, and that actually accounts for our major morbidity and mortality right now after subarachnoid hemorrhage, apart from the initial injury. Because we've gotten much better about securing the aneurysm and treating the hydrocephalus. So to the medical complications in vasospasm is both cause the most morbidity and mortality now. Um, seizure prophylaxis, and there's a debate on how long to do seizure prophylaxis. I belong to the very, very early, uh, short course. So I, I do prophylaxis until the aneurysm is secure, basically then in the last day by a day or so. Um, most people, most intensivists will probably do it for the first couple of weeks. Um, uh, there are some people who advocate longer 
the procedure prophylaxis, I don't think the evidence supports that. But there is some variability. And more, and our institution here generally ends up being the, the, the first couple of years. Uh, raising the cranial pressure is a, a consequence uh, of some of these injuries that the patients can develop, and then the neurological deficit. Cardiac complications, we talked about stunned myocardium. Patients can develop pulmonary edema, can develop acute lung injury, they can develop aspiration pneumonia, they can develop fevers and endocrine dysfunction. In particular hyperglycemia and um, sodium abnormalities, low sodium due to SIDH. They can also develop anemia venous sinus, uh, and ven uh, deep venous thrombosis in the So we're just going to talk a couple of more slides about what to do in each of these phases. So the first phase, the initial phase before supreme the aneurysm, we want the blood pressure to be less than 160, strictly. <coughs> so they're going to be on a cardio and if they're intubated, they're going to be on sedation as well. We treat the ICP, we may need uh, an ICP monitor, uh, or sorry, a ventricular ostomy in these patients. We aim for eubulimia, so the patients that have been found down, we're going to be hydrating them. Anti-seizure medications in this period, because you don't want the patient to have a seizure and spike their blood pressure. And then prepare for securing the aneurysm either by endovascular or surgical means. So these are some of the data that supports um, blood pressure control. This is the observation study for patients uh, who have re-bleeding in the ambulance and patients that re-bleed on, on arrival to the hospital. And the blood pressure is greater than 160 is associated with higher risk of re-bleeding. So from these observational data, we, we control the, um, the blood pressure. It's not a randomized controlled trial, but we can do this in most patients without uh, uh, consequence. So you'll see us keep the blood pressure less than 130, less than 140, or less than 150, but definitely less than 160. Now, when do we choose less than 140, less than 160? In our older hypertensive patients, we usually probably choose less than 160 or less than 140. For younger patients, it usually is already less than 140. Coiling versus surgical clipping, this could be a whole lecture on its own. Now, most of our patients undergo coiling from multiple randomized controlled trials, and this is the ISAT trial, the largest one showing uh, at the end 18 year follow up, 10 to 18 year follow up, uh, increased um, uh, survival at 10 years in the endovascular arm, uh, and in the increased indo uh, independent survival at 10 years in the endovascular arm. This was also, there was increased, decreased morbidity at one year in the endovascular arm. Uh, although if you just took, take it from the aneurysm perspective, there's four more aneurysms within these 2,000 aneurysms that bled in the endovascular arm in the 10 years compared to surgical arm. So from a technical perspective, surgery may still be better at securing the aneurysm, but overall, for the patient's perspective, their survival and their morbidity in the endovascular arm is better. Uh, so that's why we treat these patients in endovascular for most of the times. However, we do need surgical means to treat these patients for some patients. And for some patients, it's technically very challenging or high risk to do it in endovascular. So the surgical approach is better. These are for ruptured aneurysms. Um, so this is vasospasm. See how narrow the arteries are here? And this is after treatment of the vasospasm. It's still narrow, but not as much as before. Uh, remember, the brain is attached to the rest of the body. <laughs> Sometimes I have to remember, uh, remind our, our, our colleagues that. Um, and the other way around, too, right? It works both ways. Um, so the systemic consequences of the injury and the complications will determine how you're able to manage this. Somebody with stunned myocardium is not going to keep their, their blood pressure goal uh, of 190. They're not going to get there. Um, uh, however, you can keep the patient's blood pressure at 190 for a week if they don't have cardiac consequences. Mm -hmm. A younger patient does not have comorbidities. So, a basal spasm is narrowing in the arteries. It occurs, uh, it lasts usually for a few days. Sometimes it can last long. It lasts like up to nine days, 10 days, sometimes. Um, it may lead to cerebral ischemia and stroke. How does the patient present? These patients may get confused. So they're oriented, now they're disoriented. They may become lethargic. They may drop their level of consciousness. They're assessing level of consciousness. They may have limb weakness. So this is the thing we can be detecting with the drift, or the hand grip, and drift is a little bit better than hand grip in detecting it. Uh, they may develop a facial droop that wasn't present there. They may have a language disturbance, develop aphasia or dysmorphia. Uh, or they may have a seizure. So these are the things that you're going to detect whether it's symptomatic vasospasm, and we're using our ultrasound to detect radiographic asymptomatic vasospasm. It lasts between, it occurs between day three and day 21. That's why we give pneumonia for 21 days. And that's why the patients often hang around the hospital for quite a while. 
Um, some patients we can discharge before 21 days if they have low risk of getting it. Um, the highest period is day seven to 10. So sometimes you see a patient doing well in the ICU, being sent out of the ICU, and then being brought back when they have asymptomatic. Um, prevention, we maintain hemodynamia and we give the patient pneumodipine. Uh, detection, neurochecks, examination, uh, TCD and CTA sometimes. Um, the treatment again with pneumodipine and we do induced hypertension. We need to get the cerebral perfusion pressure to this part of the brain, even though this part of the brain is not seeing the normal map because there's an arrowing here. So even though the systemic map may be 90, the map that actually gets past that may be 65. And if the patient has an ICP of 20, that's enough, you know, barely. So that's why sometimes you're going to have these very different blood pressure parameters than you normally would, because you're resuscitating the brain. Um, uh, but there's a consequence to that, so we have to, you know, uh, uh, dance that line and, 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 and try to get the right balance. The endovascular therapy, we give the patients vasodilators that works for the proximal vessels and distal vessels. For the proximal vessels, you can also do a balloon angiogram. Often the patient needs repeated therapy, particularly if they need vasodilator therapy. This is kind of a graph just showing how we think about subarachnoid hemorrhage, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage from a vasospasm perspective. We start pneumodipine, we secure the aneurysm, we monitor the patients. Uh, if there's a change in neurological status, we assess to see if there's a uh, vasospasm. If there's no vasospasm, see what else could the change be because of. Are they febrile? Are they having an infection? Are they having a seizure? We have hydrocephalus. If it's vasospasm, we treat the vasospasm because it's symptomatic. If we detect asymptomatic vasospasm, then we have to decide is it symptomatic or is it asymptomatic? We just detect it on TCD. And there may be a little bit of perfusion imaging here, and then we decide to treat it if it needs five days. And there are multiple ways of doing it. So the recommendations, uh, this is modified from the American Heart Association Stroke Association, maintaining with bulimia, pneumodipine, and all that aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. Now, sometimes they can't tolerate the pneumodipine, and we have to reduce the dose or the frequency. And in some patients, we have to stop it altogether. If the lesion ischemia occurs, we can induce hypertension. We don't do hypervolemia anymore, we just do induced uvolemic hypertension. Considering the arterial therapy of the angioplasty patients with symptomatic vasospasm. Consider TCD monitoring, considering advanced imaging uh, to identify the areas of ischemia. We avoid prophylactic hypervolemia, because that can be put to pulmonary edema. You can think about the rest of the world. Right? And if, avoid prophylactic balloon angioplasty. So we only use it in patients that are severe. Intracerebral hemorrhage. So the bleeding within the parenchyma of the brain, and afterwards, you often patients can get edema. And it can break into other compartments, like ventricular compartment. Um, we maintain the blood pressure. They're either less than 140 or less than 160. There are multiple trials looking uh, and arguments for either, either cut off. So you'll see us use any of these ranges, less than 140, less than 160, or less than 150. Uh, and we monitor for hematoma expansion and monitor the patients clinically. If no hematoma expansion by the, day, by the next day, we can start pharmacological DVT prophylaxis in most of these patients. And we can start mobilization for these patients, and again, prevention of aspiration. Right now, surgical intervention for it and minimally invasive techniques have not shown benefit. We still do it in very selective patients, but um, that's the usual benefit. Interventricular hemorrhage, pardon me. The hemorrhage is in the ventricles. Again, we have the same blood pressure parameters and the same um, use of our DVT prophylaxis. The difference is some of the patients may need ventriculostasis, may need external ventricular pain to help drain the ventricular hemorrhage. Carotid stenting, these are um, maybe elective patients. Um, in our institution here, most of them, we take them to the CICU because uh, they've had the most experience with it, but you'll have some of our ischemic stroke patients that have undergone carotid stenting as well. Um, same as post-diagnostic angiography, we keep the blood pressure strictly less than 140 because that brain distal to the stenosis has been exposed to low blood pressure, low perfusion for a long time, so it's, it's compensated by diabetes. When you do the stenting, you don't want this rush of blood to go there and overwhelm the capacity to autoregulate, the brain's capacity to react. So while the brain is starting to adjust or readjust, we need to do the regulation for the brain and the brain's cerebral vasculature. So we keep the blood pressure less than 140 in the beginning. And again, swallow screen, may or may not need to happen, but most of the times they don't. Um, 
uh, and then uh, post procedure care early mobilization PT and UT. So uh, now we move to the last bit. There's only a couple, of, uh, three slides I think here. We're going to talk, oh, actually four slides. We're going to talk about ventriculostomy um, and uh, hyperosmolar therapy. I think everybody in this room, well, maybe everybody, half the room has already administered some of these therapies, we take care patients with this. Right. I kind of, kind of remember. <laughs> so this is an EVD. There's a chamber here, and a ruler, and there's a bag, and there's a, a, a tube coming out of this chamber that goes into the patient. So it goes from the patient's ventricle, uh, out to the skull, tunnel underneath their scalp for infection's sake, and then it comes out, and there's multiple three-way stopcocks. So you can turn it completely clamped, you can turn it on to the transducer, and you can turn it on to the drain. So, uh, and the EVD is set at the level of tragus. It's zero to the level of the tragus, and then you set the drain above that. So if you set it open at 10, anytime the ICP goes more than 10 centimeters, it's gonna start draining CSF. If you have it open at 20, only when the patient goes to have raised ICP greater than 20, it's gonna drain. Most of us, our ICP range is around 6 to 12, sorry, 8 to 12, 8 to 15. So if you leave it at 10, for most of us, if you put a ventriculostomy in it, it will drain some. So our patients with hydrocephalus, our patients with condition, we want them to drain a little bit, but not drain too much. Because any time it goes below 10, it's going to stop draining, right? So you, it, that's kind of, it, it corrects itself, right? You're not going to drain too much. It does it itself. It corrects itself. So we keep it open at 10. That's going to drain most patients, but not over drain. Very, very rarely do we keep it open at five. So usually we keep it open at 10. Now when we think the patient doesn't need it anymore, we've treated their hydrocephalus, maybe we don't need it anymore, then we raise it up to 15 or 20, and then it only drains if the patient has raised ICP. And it does it on its own. And every hour you come and record how much is in the chamber. Uh, most protocols, you dump what's in the chamber into the bag. It's all closed, you don't need to open it, so it stays sterile. And you measure the ICP at the same time. So you, clap, you have it open just to the transducer. Now, you, there is a way where you can keep it open to the chamber and the transducer at the same time. That doesn't give you an accurate ICP. For an accurate ICP, you need it open from patient to the transducer, just like any other transducer. Um, and you'll get a waveform. So if the patient has a skull and has not had a hemicraniectomy, uh, they'll have a, a waveform that looks almost like the A-line, but a little bit different, because it complies to the brain. Patients with poor compliance in the brain, the waveform is going to be different. So patients with hydrocephalus and some other conditions. Uh, patients who have had craniotomy, they have a different waveform as well, because there's no skull. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's at the, uh, the just the height uh, compared to the tragus. Most of the times we're at 10, and then later on when we're weaning, we keep it at 15 or 20. Very, very rarely do you keep it open at four, uh, 5, you know? Um, and it's a closed system. We don't add, we don't uh, drain, we don't take samples from it. In our institution here, we've decided to keep things very strict and, 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 and straightforward, that only neurosurgery insert these, and only neurosurgery are going to be the ones um, adjusting it. And only neurosurgery are the ones that deal with it if it's blocked or if they need to sample from it. It's to reduce infection risk and reduce multiple people doing the same thing. The same way with the ventilator, right? Um, you don't have every body come and manage the ventilator, you have specific people. Um, but we all need to understand how it's used and what's going on. So um, that kind of is what we just talked about, uh, what, what, what the tube is like, uh, record ICP every hour, uh, and uh, the output. We again talked about raised ICPs, ICP greater than 20 for 3 to 5 minutes, and short degree transient ranges can occur when patients strains and coughs. We want to avoid this in patients with ICP crisis. We don't want to overreact in these patients. We, they just have an ICP. They don't have ICP crisis. And they just have a, 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 a short spike that they call. Now, if somebody has repeated cough, 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 they're going to just dump out a lot of CSF. So then we need to address that. Um, and if the ICP is high, the physician may order a passive drainage of five cc's or five ml just to relieve the pressure. So. My penultimate slide, hypertonic saline. So this is what we give to reduce cerebral edema. It shrinks the normal brain to give room for the abnormal brain, whether it's a hematoma or a tumor or a, a sw swelling stroke to expand. Um, we give it at 250 cc boluses over half an hour. 
every six hours. But before we give each dose, we need to make sure that the sodium is not too high and the osmolarity is not too high. So sodium not greater than 155 or not greater than 320. So it comes in with an order of check the sodium Q6 or check the uh, osmolality Q6. And then uh, if the patient's out of parameters, you don't administer the dose and you wait till the next six hours. And later on when we need it, you go down to Q8 hours or Q12 hours. Um, if we give it for low sodium, which you do in the MIC all the, uh, not all the time, but you do it quite often, then you're giving it as a continuous drip. Usually when we use it for ICPs, we give it as bolus there. So it's a little bit different. Uh, in our protocol here, if we know we're going to give it for more than three days, or we expect to give it more than three days, we have to put a central back. If it's just a couple of doses, then, uh, or then, then we do it. Manitol comes in 20% or 25%. There's not a big difference between them. Uh, it's usually given as a load and then uh, maintenance doses, bolus therapy. Uh, and the load is usually one gram, or half a gram per kilogram. And then the maintenance is usually half a gram per kilogram. Uh, it's given either Q6 hours or Q4 hours. And the same thing, we check the sodium and osmolality before every dose. And then we give the doses if the patient's within parameters. Um, often, if the patient's need this many blood draws for this many days, we then try in order to use PD tubes for the, 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 the draws. We're not testing a lot of things, but we do need quite a few. And again, same protocol, we, if we're going to do hyperosmolar therapy for more than three days, we should have a central line for the patient. PIC line works just as well. And that's it. Thank you. I know it's a heavy lecture, but uh, I, I hope it covers the basics of ICU care, the core cerebral vascular conditions, ischemic stroke, and subarachnoid hemorrhage that we take care of. Um, and uh, also an uh, overview on how to take care of the ticket and hyper. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I have a question. Yeah. Can you talk about how um, certain strokes will transition between hemorrhagic and ischemic or vice versa? I know you touched on a little bit with yeah. the DCI, but yeah, as far so as body switch. There, there are kind of two, two things. So one is um, uh, ischemic stroke patients. So ischemic right. stroke patients come in and they have an occlusion and they have ischemia and that damages the brain. The brain gets damaged, but so do the blood vessels too. So the blood vein barrier breaks down. And these patients often need to be on antithrombotics, but even without antithrombotics, patients can have hemorrhagic transformation. Uh, and hemorrhagic transformation can range from just asymptomatic, tiny bleeding that we see on the MRI scan, to varying degrees of asymptomatic hemorrhage, to more bleeding that's even apparent on the CT scan or very obvious on the CT scan. And then you have patients who actually have a hemorrhagic transformation that causes more disruption of the brain and more uh, damage and more symptoms. So that's called symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, it's obviously symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage that we care about the most, but we want to be vigilant about asymptomatic hemorrhagic transformation because that changes how we use our antithrombotics so it doesn't become symptomatic. So this is why we do, we have very strict rules about post-TPA not giving antiplatelets and why we do the CT scan, and why sometimes we say, well, the patient has a hemorrhage, but it's okay to give antiplatelets, and sometimes we say that's not the case. Um, uh, with regards to the other way, hemorrhagic stroke then becoming to ischemic, really it's the patients with cerebral vasospasm after subarachnoid hemorrhage. So that doesn't really occur after um, intercranial, intercerebral hemorrhage or interventricular hemorrhage, but occurs after subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, by some mechanism, we still don't understand it completely, so the blood around the blood vessels, because the blood vessels are in the subarachnoid space. The mental cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery, all these arteries on the surface of the brain are in the subarachnoid space. When the patient gets a subarachnoid hemorrhage, these blood vessels are bathed with, this, with the blood. And that creates an inflammatory response in the blood vessels that then causes them to squeeze anywhere from 3 to 21 days after, usually a week after, day 7 to 10. And if that squeezing is very severe, uh, with other factors as well that we haven't identified, uh, that can lead to strokes. So this is a patient where we present as a hemorrhage, we secure the aneurysm, and then we're monitoring them to see if they develop the vasospasm. And again, similar to how hemorrhage may be symptomatic and asymptomatic, vasospasm may be symptomatic or asymptomatic. If it's asymptomatic, the patient doesn't need repeated angiography treatment. We need to optimize their blood pressure and make sure that we avoid symptomatic phases.
Um, if patients who develop symptomatic visits of they need more, obviously more therapy to kind of reverse this to prevent this. Stroke. So that's kind of how the patients make the transition from one to the next. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.